you prepare your hearts to hear the word of God, uh, know that in Zechariah, this is a prophecy concerning the Messiah that would come to bring peace to Israel and subdue all her enemies. And this is talking about Jesus Christ. Now listen to the word of God. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. As for you also, because of the blood of my covenant with you, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. This is God's word for us today. Thanks be to God. Amen. Allow me to lead us in prayer and ask the Lord to now illuminate this to our hearts. Let's pray. Oh God, your word silences the shouts of the mighty. Lord, as we hear your word, would you quiet within us every voice that is not your own? Speak to us now through the suffering and death of Jesus Christ, that by the power of your Holy Spirit we might receive grace to show Christ's love in lives given to your service. Oh, speak now, we pray. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, if you've noticed, uh, there are outside were uh, these palm branches, right? You can notice, um, if you, here in Buffalo, there's not really a lot of palm branches. In California, they're everywhere. Uh, palm Sunday is a, uh, a day in the church calendar that marks the beginning of the Holy Week, uh, the week that we remember the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if you've read the Bible, you know that in the first sort of day of that week, uh, what started off the chain of events was that Christ entered Jerusalem. Now, this was a, a momentous thing. Uh, because he entered Jerusalem not just as some like, covert operative or just as a teacher or rabbi or as a visiting professor, but he was received and received attention as king, as the very promised king here in Zechariah. And uh, I've titled the sermon Election Promises. Um, and the reason why is because every time you have a person campaigning for office or position, they make certain promises that they're oftentimes, hopefully, obliged to keep. Uh, that's usually what gets them into office is they, they give hope, right? They give, um, they give some aspirations of what their authority might accomplish. And uh, you think, you know, every president we've had, every politician that comes through has certain promises of what they'll change. And God has also elected a single vote election, a king for the earth, a ruler for all things. And there are also for God's anointed election promises. What is this king going to do? What is he going to change? How is the world going to be different with him as the ruler? And 2,000 years ago, as Christ would enter Jerusalem on this young donkey, it seems like a kind of odd image. What we actually see is that this, this presents to us the greatest and final king that our earth will see. And This king, what does that mean for us? We're going to see that this king will rule the earth in justice. That Christ will rule the earth and in doing so will bring justice, fairness, equity, peace to the earth. And secondly, that his reign, his rule will actually bring peace and blessing, prosperity and flourishing. That his rule will be good and worth celebrating and as we're commanded to do, to rejoice. And then finally, that this king will bring us salvation that God will save us in this king, that there will be rescue from life, from destruction, from all our enemies. We'll see the rule of Christ, the peace of Christ, and the salvation in Christ. Now, just a quick overview of Zechariah. Zechariah is kind of a prophetic book that oftentimes remains sort of hidden except for its New Testament prophecies. Now, why is Zechariah important? What's sort of the thing around Zechariah? Zechariah is a very timely book in some ways because it's written about... 18, 20 years after the return of the Jews from exile, from Babylon, right? Um, They were sent back to their home, to their cities, and as that happened, as Cyrus released them to have freedom and liberty, it was a desperate time for the people. They had laid the foundations for the temple, the center of their worship, the center of their religious life, but it had remained unbuilt for 20 years. There was powerful opposition to restoring the temple and the service in the temple. There was no king on the throne. If you know anything about Judaism, 
Judaism basically hinges on two primary things that are not spiritual, but are realities in life. That they would have a Davidic king, a king in the line of David, proper authority, representative leadership, that they would be ruled by a worthy man. And secondly, that the temple would facilitate worship to God, to Yahweh, that they would meet with the Lord and, and welcome his presence in sacrifice and in praise and in thanksgiving at the temple. And both of those pillars were gone. So 20 years later, what's happening? The book of, of Zechariah is speaking to a people that are beginning to lose hope, beginning to lose hope that justice would ever win, beginning to lose hope that they would ever see a worthy leader reign over them, beginning to even lose hope that God himself would ever return to bless his people. And so in the midst of this, there's a, a short little place in Zechariah where God describes the people as being a people who think that theirs is a day of small things. Nothing good is going on. Our lives are rather inconsequential and there's no blessing. It's a day of small things. And to that, God says, rejoice. Hope is coming. Deliverance is coming. And in fact, the blessings of God would be seen in the continuing restoration of the temple. If you see, things are improving. The temple will be rebuilt. It's being rebuilt. The priesthood's being restored. But finally and ultimately, the great message of hope is that a king would return to you, one from David, a branch, a shoot of Jesse. He would come to reign over you. And this would signal the final deliverance of all of God's promises for peace and rule and justice in the world. Those are fantastic promises, aren't they? Uh, when we have a leader campaign in the highest office of our land, the best he can usually promise is just peace for our land, prosperity for our land. But for God to promise that this ruler will reign over all the earth and bring peace and flourishing, only the Messiah could do this. And the Messiah is Jesus Christ. Now, the first thing we see is this. Christ, who's being referenced here, and if you look in Matthew and in John, they, they appropriate that prophecy to Jesus when he comes into Jerusalem. That is the thing. That is this is the man that he's talking about. Jesus coming to Jerusalem. Jesus the king. And what we see is that Christ will rule the earth with justice. Look at verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation. Humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And if you look in verse 10b, he shall speak peace to the nations. His rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. What's promised here is not only that the king would return to Israel to lead and protect and save her, but that he would also rule from sea to sea, that he would have worldwide dominion. Now what's interesting about this is that worldwide leaders were not a new thing. They had Nebuchadnezzar. They had Cyrus. They would have Alexander the Great. right? They would have Rome. World-spanning empires were not new. What is new is that you would have a king who would be righteous, just, meaning not only personally, morally, sort of pietistic, but in the Hebrew idea of righteousness, that he would promote justice and righteousness socially over the earth. Calvin, in his commentary, says, the king would come for the benefit of the entire people, rather than for personal advantage, as was seen so clearly in the corrupt king's Mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey, meaning Christ is coming to bless, to serve. Now this becomes abundantly clear because you look at the rest of Zechariah, particularly Zechariah chapter 10, and the deepest criticism God makes of Israel is that her leaders are corrupt, they're self-serving. They're using their position of power to exploit their people for personal gain. Doesn't that resonate with the leadership we see in our world? That it becomes a platform for personal power and privilege and gain rather than as a vehicle to serve. In fact, Christ makes so much clear with us that you know, the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. They lord it over you. Their power is for themselves and it's used for personal privilege. But not so with you. Not so with, because with Christ, not so with me. That's not what power is for. My friend Duke Kwan, in sort of giving this devotional on, on Palm Sunday, said, what you really see on Palm Sunday, the entrance of this kind of king mounted on a donkey is the repurposing of power. That power is no longer used for personal or tribal advantage, but it's used now in Christ for worldwide blessing, worldwide service, worldwide justice. The world will 
often have times where there is one person on the top of the hill, right? one king who rules over all things, one, one Caesar or emperor. But the joy of Palm Sunday is that we have a king who's mounted on a donkey, humble, who restrains his power to bless his people. You know, if you've heard any sort of Palm Sunday sermons, you'll probably have heard this sort of historical fact, right? Um, a donkey was not like a, uh, it wasn't a silly vehicle, right? You would enter into a city if you're a king in two kind of ways. You'd either enter on a war horse, and a war horse is like the modern day equivalent of a dictator riding in on a tank, right? Like just flashing a saber and a sword and you know, honking the horn and blasting off shells, like, that sort of gives a very visible demonstration of power and authority. It's meant to instill fear and kind of establish a person's power, right? Um, and it's particularly done oftentimes because a person's rule is a little under question, right? They want to demonstrate their power. That was what a war horse would do. But a donkey wasn't a silly ride. A donkey was actually a beast of royalty. But it was a particularly a beast of royalty that you used when you're coming in a time of peace, when your reign is so legitimately received that there's no question of insurrection or assassination or combat. In fact, uh, one way to think about it is a donkey was kind of like an ancient limousine. You know, when you see a, a, a leader riding in a limousine, he's safe, right? He feels safe. He, he is expressing comfort in his rule. He's not coming in he's riding on an aircraft carrier threatening to blast the place to death. My friend made a joke, and I thought of Dongo when I heard this. It's like a Lemuel zine. It's a, it's a, it's a beast, a royal carriage. And uh, <laughs> uh, I just, my mind, it's, uh, I heard Dongo's voice say this. Um, what, does that, what does that say to us? It really means that Christ's rule is going to be gentle. It doesn't mean that Christ is impoverished of power. It doesn't mean that he doesn't have authority or strength. What it means is that strength is it's reserved in love and gentleness because he's coming in peace. There's a promise that Israel would one day completely disarm themselves of all their weapons of war. That his people would live unarmed. And what does that show? It's that his reign is so secure and that justice would be from sea to sea because his reign would be complete. His reign means justice. His reign means righteousness for all. And this is the promise that God makes, that he would choose a king that is righteous and peacemaking. This is our, our basic sort of problem, right? Um, we oftentimes think of humility as a weakness rather than, rather than a strength. We think about this oftentimes with our own leaders. If they're more braggadocious, if they're more sort of assertive, if they're just very bold people, that they'd be good leaders. And oftentimes that is true in some earthly ways. But our king coming to us is gentle, humble, he restrains his power for the sake of his people. And he brings justice. Now, the second thing that he does is this. He's not only just, but he will bring peace to the earth, universal flourishing, blessing under his reign. Look at verse 10. The promise of what will happen as a result of his reign. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. And this is why his rule shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. In Hebrew, if you've ever heard this before, peace is not just meaning like end of conflict, right? That's part of it, meaning there's an end of sort of relational conflict or social or, or national conflict. But peace had a far deeper idea because peace in, in Hebrew really meant end of every conflict, end of internal conflict, end of physical just disease conflict, end of every kind of disharmony in life. It really meant holistic, full flourishing and prosperity. So if you were poor, but the race, rest of your nation was rich, that's not peace. If you're sick, that's not shalom. If you're fighting with your neighbor and there's a dispute of, over territory, that's not peace. If you're internally depressed and hopeless and despondent, that's not shalom, that's not peace. And the promise here is that this king would bring worldwide, international blessing and prosperity. Notice how he de describes this. Ephraim was the greatest, the largest northern tribe of Israel at the time, the greatest military power. And the promise is that Ephraim, that their chariots would be cut off. That'd be 
like modern day tanks, right? I know it's just a, a vehicle with horses, but there was a powerful tool of war back in the day that those would be destroyed, no longer needed. The battle bow, uh, I'm sorry, for Jerusalem, the war horse, taken away. Jerusalem being the capital city, the seat of the king and also the place of the temple, the center of all of the religious and political life of Israel, there would be no war horse. And not only that, but finally the battle bow shall be cut off. Now, what does that, what does that teach us? If you'll notice this, to get to the point where a nation would willfully disarm themselves, how can you get there? It's not just that there's peace. There, there have been times of temporary peace, but it's when the very threat of conflict is gone. That is the kind of rule that Christ brings. Or even the possibility of death, war, hatred, but all of it is wiped away, finally and cataclysmically. Now, when you think about this, I have a hard time preaching this kind of stuff sometimes because I realize in the modern day sort of way we think about this, um, we're, so, we're so skeptical of the imperialism of Christian religion, right? That we think of Christianity and all kinds of religions as sort of floating from place to place and people to people through cultural dominance, right? And oftentimes, and that, that is a sin of our church in the past, is that we sometimes transport not only the gospel, but our own sort of personal societal hang-ups to a, to a group. And we say, this is what you need to do. Basically, you need to become European and white, or you need to become Korean, or you need to become what we are to adopt the gospel. And that's wrong, right? The gospel is transcultural. However, I want you to know that the only way that the Bible presents the possibility of final justice and peace and flourishing in the land is by a single leader. We're hesitant to adopt that because we think, you mean like North Korea? Like Stalinist Russia? Like Hitler? You mean like a dictator? That seems like an incredible vehicle of corruption to entrust power like that. And I want to tell you something. That is true. That is true amongst us. That is true amongst humanity. And in fact, that's exactly what you saw when Israel elected their own leader. Right? They wanted Saul. In their minds, they thought, tall, good fighter, good representative. Let's pick that guy. And they were not just disappointed, they were sorrowfully Sorrowfully disappointed very, very soon. He was a coward. He was insecure. He fought based according to his strength. And when, he, when his strength wasn't enough, he just he fled. He didn't listen to God. And in every kind of way, the, people that they want, the, the leader that they wanted was the wrong guy. Now God's remedy to that is this. He will pick a leader. He will choose a leader who will be righteous, who will bring justice, who will will speak peace. And if you actually think about the complexity of the issues of justice in our world, I think anybody that works in any kind of social services, any kind of social benefits or, or work to improve society, you realize how, how impossibly complex it is to actually help things. You know what I'm talking about? If you work in healthcare, you realize that you can't just fix somebody up and send them on their way, that they're going to be back in another few weeks if they keep drinking, Right? If they don't fix their diet, you can't fix that part. You can only address a little portion of it. If you work in education and you think this generation's lost, we're going to educate the next. And they're going to come back smarter. They're going to come back with better ideas. And they're going to be better. You just you realize after you work in education, no, they're not. <laughs> like, these, are not these are not the world's saviors. They're just like us in a new generation. And you watch Black Mirror, you just get a little more afraid. You're like, uh, it's going to get worse, I think. I don't think it's going to get better. I think they're going to they're gonna maybe do worse. I don't know. Uh, you see signs that things don't necessarily get better. If you work in the field of promoting economic prosperity, if you work a good job and you're adding to the welfare of people, producing good things for the world, you realize that you can never have enough to end greed and conflict. right? In every kind of way that you work in society, even you know, as pastors, as church members, and every kind of microwaves we work, we realize it cannot work from just one field of life getting right. And God's answer to that, and this has been the historical answer, is if you have a king who is responsible for and has authority over every area of life all at once, over education, over the arts, over justice, 
and punishment over religion, over every aspect of life. Now that's, that's incredible liability because if there's even a hint of evil in him, he'll wreck it. But if that man is righteous and if that is the man whom God has appointed, then we like Israel can rejoice. We just, we grow despondent because we've never seen a guy like that. Not until Jesus Christ. You know, one day, one day, when Christ's reign is complete, we'll never have a second amendment. Right? There will be no need because there will be no danger. You're never going to see a school shooting not because we've just fixed one aspect of gun control or mental health or whatever it is. It's because the potential shooters will have inner peace. That's the promise. That they'll be so well, that the whole world will be well together that the promises of the new kingdom to come is that swords will be beaten into plowshares, meaning, think about this, it's like AR-15s will be turned into farming tools. You're not going to need them. That's the best thing they're going to be doing. That Christ will bring worldwide peace and flourishing. Now finally, and I think most importantly, the king we're shown here is legitimate because we're going to see that he brings salvation to his people that in fact God will save his people through this king. And in fact, I point out through the saving of this king. Now, look at verse 9, and I want to unpack this for us. Uh, depending on the, the version of the Bible you're reading, it'll translate uh, the second part of that verse differently. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous or just, and having salvation is he. There are different ways that that might be translated. In the NASB, the New American Standard would say he is endowed with salvation. It's a weird way to describe that. In the RSV, the Revised Standard, and a couple other versions, it would say he's triumphant and victorious, that it's a victorious sort of celebratory coming into the city. But literally the phrase there, and why it's kind of a difficult thing to translate, literally it means he is saved, that the king is saved, the king is delivered. Now, Hebrew might be using that in a way to describe that he is sort of bringing that salvation with him, uh, that that salvation is his to sort of usher in. But I would actually take the view that I think the literal reading is right. He is saved. The king himself is vindicated. The king himself is delivered. The king himself has been rescued. Now, how is that possible? If you look back in the Old Testament, the only two places, again, this is a little bit deeper, and I, wanna, I want you to follow me here, the only two places where this particular rendering of the word salvation is used is in two places. Psalm 33, where the psalmist writes, a king is not saved by his great army. And secondly, in Deuteronomy 33, 29, who is like you, O Israel, a people saved by the Lord? Now what's going on here? It's, it's not an easy text, and uh, it's, it's not easy to see how that sort of links in with our salvation. But I want you to follow me here. One of the deepest hallmarks of the true king whom God has anointed is that he rests upon the power and vindication and salvation of God and not his own strength. Okay, trace back with me. When you look back at David, the most memorable sin that he did was to sleep with Bathsheba and to conspire to murder her, his, his husband, her husband, right? That's the most memorable one. That's the most story time one. But you realize the sin that excluded David from building the temple, he was a man of war. What is the great sin that God called him on? It was not adultery. It was not even murder. You know what it was? He counted people. A census. Really odd, right? He, he numbered Israel. Now why? Because it says later in, uh, in 2 uh, Samuel, he wanted to count the valiant men who could draw a sword. He wanted to number his soldiers. He wanted to know what he had. He wanted to assess his ability to conquer, to defend. He was planning rule based upon the resources and visible things around him and his own strength. He was ruling in his own strength. That's the thing. That's why he was disqualified. And you think, what's the big deal? Every good leader does that. In fact, didn't Jesus say, if you're going to go to war, you count your soldiers? Right? We're going to go to war. We're going to number our drones. We're going to count how many ships we have. We're going to do all the math, right? How do you not do that? Well, because if you remember in the Old Testament, if you've been reading through the Old Testament, just, you know, Bible in a year kind of thing, 
you'll notice that as you read, the constant theme as Israel takes over the promised land is, it's not going to happen because you're a mighty people. It's not because you're tall. In fact, the Philistines are taller than you, right? The, the people in Canaan are way bigger than you. They're way stronger than you. And it's not because you're a numerous people. You're not. You're not going to win because you just had the right resources and you applied them to the problem. You're going to win because, as you see in Joshua, I am the divine warrior and I will fight for you. And so God says crazy things sometimes. Take less people because I will not be glorified if you win by numbers. Take less. Take a few. And I'll be seen as powerful. I will demonstrate my power through your weakness. And in fact, the kings of Israel would also flourish in that light. If you've read through the Psalms, it's not that too hard to read the Psalms, you keep reading this kind of psalm that is a very Davidic, kingly kind of psalm, which is, save me from my enemies. Right? They slander me. They accuse me unjustly. They conspire against me. They wait for me. It's this constant complaining about his enemies. And if you ever think to yourself, dude, David, you're the king. Call your secret service and kill them. Murder them. What are you, what are you praying for? If somebody speaks against you, call one of your mighty men and just send them into the, the neighborhood and wipe them out. Why are you praying and complaining to God? Why are you waiting for God to vindicate you? Dude, David, you, you killed Goliath. Go draw your sword and go run down there and just take care of business. You got buddies. You got a few hundred men who will die for you. Go. Who's complaining against you? That's how kings used to rule, right? You said something I don't like, your family's gone, erased. They never existed. That's how ruling went. But David, and again here, hinting at the kind of king that would finally be the king that God sends, depended on God. Lord, you rescue me. Lord, you humiliate my enemies. Lord, you deliver me. God, not by my strength, but I want you to be seen as the king over Israel. So rescue me. Save me. I will wait for you. I'll be quiet before you. So how does that link to Jesus? So here's what happens. What makes this king so humble? What makes him so meek? It's that his powers are strained to wait upon the deliverance of God. And you know what that is for Jesus Christ? He's coming into Jerusalem, and here's the story. We call it Palm Sunday because they were waving palm branches before Jesus Christ entered Jerusalem. Why were they doing that? They were crying, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest, right? Save us, we pray. Why? Why were they waving palm branches? If you remember in our series, palm branches were not like a religious symbol. They were a nationalistic symbol. It's like waving American flags, right? Or, or waving eagles, if you have eagles, I guess. Like, that's our symbol, right? To wave palm branches when, uh, when the Maccabean sort of insurrection happened and they took back land and they fought and had victory, the palm, the palm branch was a symbol of Israel. It's a symbol that we're getting ours, right? And so here's what Israel's thinking. And here's what you, and I'm going to link this to us. Here's what they're thinking. When God sends his king, it's going to be like Alexander the Great. Victory after victory, conquest after conquest, and Jesus is that guy. The paradoxical irony is he's coming in on a donkey, not a war horse. They're thinking, Cyrus, worldwide empire, submitted nations, power, his path to victory will be on the blood and bodies of his enemies. But in fact, the whole gospel narrative is leading, no, it's going to be through weakness. It's going to be through God vindicating his king, saving his king, showing his king to be righteous. And you know where God does that? It's not on the cross. I mean, there we see the righteousness of God displayed upon sin, but it's in the resurrection. In his death, Christ was power, remained powerless to raise himself. He was waiting upon his father to do what he promised, which was to save his righteous king. And as the Holy Spirit would come as the agency of God's will to save him, to vindicate him, to show him as righteous, that's how you know Christ is a true king because he didn't just conquer and imperialize his religion and just spread that out by power the way that religions like Islam say will happen. Rather, it's going to be through weakness. He will not take his enemies by force but God will show that his king is his own and righteous. That's what Palm Sunday is about. That God, 
in saving his anointed king really is how God saves us. In fact, if you think about it, um, I think John Piper said it this way. If you think about like just the nature of the resurrection, the only way that this king could actually bring peace to us, to the nations, is through the resurrection because there he, he, he lives forever. He, he imparts that life to us. That's the nature of it. Now let me just ap- apply this in a few ways. Um, first, if you've been rescued by the repurposed power of Christ, um, I'm reading here a quote from Duke Kwan, so um, again, I'm not plagiarizing, I'm, I'm referencing, I'm, uh, I'm researching. Here, here's what Duke Kwan says, I, I loved how he said this. If you've been rescued by the repurposed power of the cross, here's a Palm Sunday question for you. How will you, like your king, repurpose the power you possess? Power is typically deployed towards self, my name, my gain. To repurpose it would be to, to be giving it a creative alternate use. How can you redirect and redeploy resources away from yourself and toward your neighbor? And he goes on, meaning Christ's power, authority, privilege, and resources would be used to bless, save, and give a holistic peace and wellness to the nations. That's why he had power. Not to save himself, not to employ himself, not to gratify himself. His power was for others. And so the question, how is God calling you in that respect to use that power, authority, privilege? And in fact, particularly for the sake of the poor, the oppressed, the forgotten, the marginal and vulnerable in your community. If you want to live out Palm Sunday in your personal life, the way that you do that is take an assessment. What has God granted, granted you in your life in terms of power, in terms of resources, in terms of your ability, in terms of influence? What has he given you? And if you want to make Palm Sunday real, then you think, how can I use this for the benefit and flourishing and blessing of others around me? Because that's why Christ came with power. Not to save himself, not to vindicate himself, not to establish himself, but to bless his people, and the society around him. Take a look and think. We oftentimes feel pretty impoverished for power, pretty impoverished for privilege, pretty impoverished for all kinds of things in which we can use to change the world. But we have them, and for anything like Christ and his kingdom, we have those things for the sake of promoting peace everywhere. And in fact, Christ as the resurrected king enables us to live radically, to live a radically giving life. You know, if you think about this, apply this devotionally for just a minute. Even Jesus needed to trust in God. He needed to trust that God would save him. He needed to trust that God's will would happen to show righteousness. He was tempted in every way just as we are, and in that way, a perfect high priest. He knows what it's like to be tempted to disbelieve, to think that, the, that life is just going to go the way it's going to go and nothing's going to stop it. But he believed in God and his vindicating power. He believed in the resurrection. And for us, what I think this shows us is that unless you believe in the salvation of God, you can't really live a generous life. You can't live an other-centered life. You're always going to be wondering, if it's just all there is, I've got to use what I have for myself, right? I have to use my position to, to get myself forward, to be more secure, to get more friends. I have to use it for myself if this is all there is. But if you, like Christ, trust in the saving power of God. No one can stand in your way. No one can threaten your ultimate final well-being. No slander will stick. And in fact, let me apply this particularly for those who are in positions of leadership. If you're a Christian in this room and you have any kind of authority in any kind of field, if you have even influence where people listen to you, right, the fact that you even have Facebook that people read your posts or Instagram, they look at your pictures, there's a certain amount of, of influence in your life that people just care what you think and what you do, right? That's power, that's authority in some ways. Let me put it this way. That exists ultimately for service, not for privilege. Reassess it and re- repurpose it. And in fact, in Zechariah 10, as Israel's leaders were criticized for being like shepherds who exploited their sheep, who used the ones that they had power over. Consider the grace of God that he saw his flock as a precious possession. He says on verse 16, On that day the Lord their God will save them as the flock of his people, for like the jewels of a crown they shall shine on his land. That God looked at his flock, at us, not as resources, but as a precious possession. Let me close this up in just one way. We're told to rejoice, to shout aloud. That's said for 
both the daughter of Zion, the daughter of Jerusalem, the people of God gathered in this capital. What you don't see, because our sermon only hit a few verses here, is the first part of chapter 9. The first part of chapter 9 pronounces judgment. And it's on a ton of people. Judgment on all of Israel's enemies, on all the surrounding nations, on Hadrach, on Damascus, on Hamath, Tyre, Sidon, Ashkelon, Gaza, Ekron. It sounds like God's just giving a list of all the, the, the nations around them and saying, you will be afraid. Your people will become desolate. There will be judgment. It's not a, it's not a happy verse for them. And here's, here's the mystery of it all. You read this and you think, Zechariah, that's a Hebrew name. This sounds particularly, decidedly Jewish, right? Jerusalem, Zion, that sounds like something for Israel. Are you just sort of stretching that to say, well, it's for all of us, right? Collected, multinational, sort of international, multi-ethnic people. It seems Jewish. How does this come down to us and blessing us today? Well, here's why. Do you know what Paul says the mystery of the gospel is? What he was entrusted to do. He says in Ephesians chapter 3, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, the mystery of the king that actually came, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. What's that mystery? When Jesus actually revealed himself, what became clear? Here's what became clear. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the same promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So he makes this abundantly clear. The blessing of this king is not for all nations, in a way. It's not for just anybody. It's not for a subdued people that remain in rebellion. It's only for those who join themselves to Christ and his kingdom. So here's the, here's the offer. The peace is available. It's, it's, it's an option for any and everybody, no matter what background you have, no matter what your religious background, no matter what your ethnic background, whoever you are, you can have the peace of this king. That's the promise. But only if you come to him through the gospel, meaning you trust in him as your king. Here's what the deal looks like. The king has come on the donkey, and Revelation promises there will be a day where he comes on the horse because his enemies will continue to persist in rebellion. And on that day, who will be the ones who stand in his kingdom? It's the ones who kneel today, now. That's the choice. And I realize that's it's kind of exclusivistic. It doesn't particularly feel like a, a nice, maybe a nice way to end the sermon. But I want you to know that Christ is more than any other ruler that has ever existed, inclusivistic. But it's on his terms. Anybody is welcome to be a member of his kingdom to live in his peace, to share in his salvation. Anybody is welcome, but not on your terms, because he's the king. He's not a servant. He's not an advisor. He is the one who rules, and in doing so, we join with him. He doesn't join with us. I want to invite you, in response to this, if you want to have this peace that only Christ can provide, if you feel like the people in Zechariah's time where you're thinking, we're a people of small days, nothing really good is happening now, and it doesn't look like it's getting any better. You long for peace. Know that Jesus Christ himself and him alone can give you that peace, but only if you trust in him by faith, as he's presented to you in the gospel, that he died for you, and in his resurrection, God vindicates his son to say, he is mine. Trust in him, follow him, obey him. Let's respond in faith and let's pray together. Lord God, we do long for the days of peace. God, our hearts, Lord, we wonder how many times we can be stunned by, by shootings in schools. God, our hearts feel like they become calloused every time they read the, note, the news. Father, we become dejected, disappointed, in fact, sometimes hopeless at the leadership our world can provide us. Who shall lead us to peace, to flourishing, to prosperity, to blessing? God, we're sick of the days of compromise. God, we're tired of the times of just choosing whoever's available. God, and just scratching by. 
God, we feel the same burden of the people in Zechariah's day. We long for a king, a good king, a righteous king, a king who is humble, here to serve us, a king who would bring peace, Lord, not only to his tribe, but God, to all the lands. God, we willingly and joyfully submit to him all authority. Lord, may he begin his reign, even now in the church, to command us what he will and to find not begrudging citizens, but joyful sons and daughters who do the will of Christ because we know that he is wise, Lord, that he loves us, and God, that his reign will bring peace to all the world. Father, what a worthy king we have. God, may the world see him day by day more clearly. And Father, may he lovingly subdue all those that are his, God, until the day he comes again. We trust in him completely, or at least that's our desire. Father, make us to submit to him in joy and rejoice as Zion and Jerusalem does when they see their coming king. God, thank you for Jesus. We pray this, Lord, in his name. Amen.